Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, May 19th. We are picking up for our Wednesday afternoon Bible class for May 5th. We had no class on May 12th because we had a missions conference, but we are glad to be back together and to continue on. So I say that in case if you're on YouTube looking for, you know, or the Bitly site looking for a class that's missing, you're not missing anything. We are going to do a quick review because we have a few new ones and we want to get them on the same page with us and then we will be picking up under the constellation of Libra and we will be looking at the, in, in detail the first uh, decon we'll look at is lupus. If you want to be looking for that, look on the right hand bottom side of your charts to get in the right area. <clears throat> but let me just give you the background very quickly that what we are studying is God's astronomy. We are not studying Satan's astrology. We know that all Satan can manage to do is counterfeit God. Doesn't have an original thought, doesn't create, doesn't come up with something brand new, doesn't come up with something out of nothing. But he certainly can take the truth and then twist it to his liking. And that's what's come down today to be called astrology. I am not advocating astrology in any way, shape, form, or manner. I will tell you, don't even open up the newspaper and read a little horoscope. No. All of that is his territory and you don't want to be playing there. But we don't give over to Satan. We keep for, for God what is pure and what is from God. And if we can see it in the Bible, that's our authority. Not what Rochelle says, what the Bible says. So laying it down very quickly in uh, Bereshit, Genesis chapter 15, verses 5 and 6, we have that Avraham was taken outside to look at the stars that God was showing him. This is Elohim, the God of Israel, Elohim Israel. This was probably 2,500 years before what we know of the written word to be written and formed into the books that we have been given down to today. But God put his message in the stars long before that written word was written down. When we look at Genesis 15, 5, God told Abraham to count the stars. Unfortunately, that's the word chosen by the, the, uh, the, the people who translate, the translators <laughs> um, from the Hebrew. I say unfortunate because as soon as we hear the word count, we go one, two, three. <laughs> In Hebrew, it's narrate, tell, declare. The very same word translated count in Genesis 15.5 is translated declare in Psalm 19.1. I'll get to there in just a moment. Genesis 15, now God's telling Abraham, tell the story, narrate it if you can. When we get all the way into our Brit Hadashah, our new covenant, we get to the time that Yeshua in human form was walking on this earth. Abraham's like 2500, if I'm, if I'm remembering right, B.C., and Yeshua is into the A.D., just, you know, into that first, let's just call it 40 A.D. It was prior to that, but we'll just round it to that. So we're talking a long distance in between. And Yeshua said, Abraham saw my day. This is John 8, by the way, if you want the reference, it's John 8, 56, Yochanan 8, 56. Yeshua said that Abraham saw Yeshua, saw his day, rejoiced in it. It was counted to him for righteousness. Now, that's the same thing when we go back to Genesis 15. We're told that what Abraham saw, he believed in, and it was counted to him for righteousness. This is where we know it wasn't just counting how many children you're going to have. Well, that was being true. Also, God was also promising Abraham, and it, not just an extensive family, but that through that family would come the seed, singular. That seed, Galatians 3.16, we're told, is none other than Yeshua, Jesus. Abraham saw the stars as God was telling him to narrate that story, that his seed would be Yeshua, Jesus, who would die and resurrect, be born, die, and resurrect for the forgiveness of our sins. That's what he put his faith in. That is what would be counted for righteousness. You never count a righteous by believing you're going to have a whole lot of children. That righteous is the righteous works of our God and having it applied to ourselves. It's taking Yeshua's perfect <laughs> sinless blood and putting that on the altar in place of our own blood that is sinful. The wages of our sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Yeshua, through Jesus Christ our Lord, through his shed blood. So when we see and put all this together, we're seeing that in, in Genesis, 2,500 years before the written word, Abraham is seeing there's a day coming 
when Yeshua is going to die on the cross, resurrect, his blood is going to be placed on the mercy seat in, in Abraham's place, and on the basis of seeing and believing that what God is showing him is true and declaring it for himself, he is now declared righteous. We have that same righteousness declared for us when we look back to the cross. We don't see Yeshua any better than Abraham did. We look back and take by faith that what we've been told is true. He looked forward, being, believing that this would be true. Um, I lost my, I thought I had a thought. When it comes back, I'll put it back in, but let me just move forward. Um, when we're told he was narrating and telling the story, he was declaring it, and I brought up that that's the same word in Psalm 19.1. Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Okay, how are the heavens declaring it? How are they narrating it? How are they telling it if it's the same word? Through the study of the gospel and the stars, we begin to get insight to how they're telling the story. God took, I believe, Abraham through at least the year, the major uh, constellations that we're studying. This is the only part that you'll hear that applies in astrology today, is the names like Libra and Virgo and Sagittarius that sort of those 12 main names are still used today but we're going to go look at stars that are in them we're going to look at the ancient names of those stars in ancient hebrew ancient aramaic ancient arabic we're going to see that they tell the story that what they were named and remember we're told in scripture that god named the stars so when we get back into the original what we have left and we don't have every star and know every name but we have enough to put a complete picture together each of the constellations is going to tell a part of the life of Yeshua Jesus. We see the complete in his, uh, in the overall, we see this from, from his first coming all the way to his second coming. We see him coming suffering and uh, being the servant for, it, for us, and we see him coming back ruling and reigning. We see toward the future, but not all the way into eternity future. We'll have a new road map then, a new sky map, shall I say then. Who knows how God will reveal it to us then. But the heavens now, we're telling you the stars are telling the story. They're declaring the glory of God. What is the glory of God? <laughs> Hebrews 1.3 tells us the glory of God is none other than express image, the radiant image of God named Yeshua, Jesus, whom God has spoken to us in his finality spoken in prophets spoke through time but now had spoken in his son and the work is complete in his son so that gives us that overall that tells us how someone like enoch who lived all the way back just seven generations off of adam so very very early in human history and he could talk about yeshua jesus returning in second coming which is still future so we're talking almost we're talking over 5,000 years, I'll put it that way, of human history, and yet Enoch could say that the Lord will return, and he would return with 10,000s of his saints. How did Enoch know that? I believe he also had seen the gospel given to him in the stars. We have many indications through scripture where we see that, that the stars were telling. Even our shepherds were watching the stars at night. They were telling, passing down to their children, not just the genealogy, but as the sky will change above them. The stars you see tonight in, where are we in the year? Springtime. You won't see the same stars in the fall. And as they would change, then the, the fathers were passing down to the sons. All of this, I believe that God kept it very clear until written word was there where we don't have to depend on the stars and as all things when you're not dependent you tend to lose some of it just like the look for a nabataean trail Nab nabataean pathway um i'm trying there's another word i want the trade routes the trade routes don't go to the same places so some of those places are, are like a ghost town all that's left is what we from archaeology can discern about them because something changed so as the course changed and we were not dependent on the stars only have the written word god has not seen to it that every bit of it was preserved but certainly enough that it is absolutely mind-blowing with that in mind hurrying past the background I won't go into it all except just remember the Tower of Babel was again the beginning of Satan's counterfeit to study the stars themselves, to worship the stars themselves, to worship the constellations instead of worshiping the God who created them. 
here's where the warp began, and it continues all the way down to today. Now, we also looked in our background at how we see that the stars were to be signs, and signs were to be signifying of someone or something coming, and we saw that Yeshua's forthcoming was what they were telling. <coughs> Then I believe the first that we looked at, and it's in the first book. The first book is, we've got three books that we'll go through, four main constellations in each book, and three minor ones under each major one. So we'll look at 48 constellations before we're done. The 12 major you know by name, and the 36 minor, it's probably some of them you haven't even heard of. But as we go through it, you'll see it. In that first book, in Virgo, the Redeemer, we see, well, in the first book we see talks about the Redeemer, his first coming, the sufferings of the Messiah. Chapter 1 in this book is the prophecy of that promised seed of the woman that I have already explained. But in the Virgin, in Virgo, we saw that there was, and I'm not going to go through it all, but we saw that, that she even, in one of her decons, one of her smaller constellations, the baby, well, in Virgo herself, we see the branch. The branch we know is the name for the Messiah. In one of the decons, we see that it's not a branch anymore. It's a small child because the child had been born and tells the story. It goes on and tells the story. So Coma is the first smaller constellation in uh, Virgo, and I don't think I went back and got those pictures. I didn't expect to do the extensive review. I'll get them for another time, Roger. He was looking for them. Um, coma is the woman and the child, okay? And we see, again, that it, this child was called the branch in Virgo. The, the skirt of the woman was a picture of the righteousness that when the Lord robes us with his righteousness, that's what we're seeing. Um, coma tells us that, the, again, the child had been born. And I'm trying to think what follows. I've got to get, here we go. <clears throat> Centaurus, that's what comes next. The next small constellation under Virgo was a God-man figure, and it showed us one who is a picture of the Lord himself, who is fully God and fully man at the same time, the dual nature. When we looked at Centaurus, one of the amazing things about it is this will fade and then come back brighter, come back very brightly. And we see in that the fading is the humility of the Lord as the suffering servant who came to die. The glory is when he returns in his second coming, all his glory, and will never be seen in the, in the uh, suffering side again. Um, the third decon, the third small one under Virgo, and Roger is trying to point some of them out, is Bootis or Bootis, Baotis, I am not sure I'm pronouncing right, but that is a man that, that um, kind of toward the middle, it looks like he's walking quickly there, right there. Roger's just blowing it up right there. It's supposed to be one who is the coming one who is coming rapidly. And remember when we talked about the stars signifying someone coming, here's the one who is coming. He is coming with a sickle in one hand, that's showing judgment. And he is also coming with a staff like the shepherd, the anointed one that would come as shepherd. The shepherd will not only shepherd his sheep, but he separates the sheep from the goats. So we see a judgment when he comes. All of this we're seeing now has gone from the child that was born on the lap of the virgin to the one who will come back to roll and to reign, who will come in judgment, and who will separate the sheep and the goat. The, sheep's going in, the sheep going into uh, the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and the goats being cast out because they were not believers. They were not with him. All that under Virgo. That's then we moved the into... Story. That's booties, yeah, B-O-O-T-E-S. I, well, I want to call it booties, but <laughs> that makes you think of something you put on your feet or your kitty cat. <laughs> or your <laughs> body. <laughs> All right, or Loretta says it even makes us think of your bottom. <laughs> okay. Now, Virgo was, again, the promised seed of the, the, the women was seen, the branch, um, the, the two natures, the, oh, I know what I left out. We see um, the piercing victim. Um, there we go. There we go. Centaurus. Last time we didn't look at who he pierced. Okay? He pierced yeah. lupus. He pierced who we're going to pick up with today, what we haven't talked about yet. But we only looked at the God. That looks like a half man, half horse. It's the dual nature, you know, is what we are seeing there. <clears throat> when we come into Libra, 
which is the sign Libra, right where you've got Roger, this is perfect, yes. We're seeing Libra. Now he'll show you some other pictures. I believe I started with Libra with, with more pictures. But what that is is if you're looking down, and I forgot I was going to try to put it somewhere where Roger could get a better picture. So I'll let you do it, Roger, because you know where to put it in front of the camera. Um, <laughs> yeah. This gives you an idea of the scales you're supposed to be looking at. It's, it's the scales of justice. Um, we see it in our um, law. You know, it's that type of scale. You're looking down at it, so it's kind of hard to see. Up so at the it's top, it's kind of looks like a kidney, or <laughs> some have said kidney. Some say it looks like a weird sideways eight. Uh, you can use yeah. your imagination. And remember, we talked about how the shapes that we draw are not what matter. That helps us understand or helps us remember. Someone else may draw the this, this shape a little differently. I'll tell you when I went looking for pictures for you, like lupus the victim, here it looks like some say a wolf or a dog. I saw some that, that looked more like, what, a moose? <laughs> I mean, you know, there can be differences, but overall they're telling the same thing. Uh, so back on track, Libra is going to tell us about the Redeemer's atoning work, okay? We're going to see the person, we're going to see the work, and we will see the triumph of the Redeemer. We're never left hanging with our Redeemer in, at that point of death alone. We're always brought into his glory. I love that. We looked last, uh, two weeks ago now, we looked at the scales. The scales are God's justice. He is coming to be the just judge, to rule justly and fairly. And we're seeing that the price that needs to be paid to balance the scale, remember how there would be one side and you'd have to put on the other side if you were buying, you know, a pound or something, then they'd put a pound weight on this side and they put, you know, grapes or wheat or, you know, whatever on this side. And when the scales would balance, that's the amount that you would take with you. Obviously, you're going to get a whole lot more bulk for a pound of cotton than you are going to if you're buying a gold brick. You know, that could be very small. So the, the scales would have to be balanced for it to be just. Often it was said that, that merchants were unfair with their scales. They'd stick their thumb on a scale. They'd do all kinds of things to make it in their favor. Well, our God is dealing justly and fairly, but the price that needs to be paid is deficit. We do not have enough to pay the price. The price has to cover our redemption. That's what's being purchased, is our redemption. Man is found weighing in the balance, and he's found wanting. He's not found that he has enough. Step into the human race, our kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer could purchase back land that had been lost by a family. But it had to be one who was of the family, one who was able to pay the price, and one who was willing to pay the price. Here's where we see the glory of our Lord, that he took on human form so he could buy it back for humanity, what humanity lost, our redemption, our right to be in the presence of our Lord God forever, because we're sinful. He could redeem us by paying the price. How could he pay the price? Did he have enough? Yes, he had his very own sinless blood. What does God require for our sin? The, the um, okay, it's Leviticus 17, 11, I can't start. The life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it to you on the altar for forgiveness of sin, for without the remission of, of without the, the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. This starts in Leviticus 17 and it goes on. What are we saying? The price put on the scale is redemption. The only thing that will equal that is perfect sinless blood. Now, do any of you have blood you can give? Can you step up to the plate, put your sinless blood on this scale and buy your justice? No. We know all of humanity cannot. All are born under the curse of sin. It entered into the world through Adam, the first Adam. The second Adam is not the second human to be born. It's the one that we call Yeshua Jesus. He is said to be the second Adam because he stepped into the human race and he said, I'll step up to the scales. I'll put my blood on the scale and I will procure your salvation for you forever. Now the price has been paid. So that's what we see with the, the scales is that the purchase price 
has been paid in full. I gave scriptures before, that's why I'm not giving them now, but please go to the earlier lessons if you haven't heard it before and get the scriptures and see. Rochelle didn't make this up. She didn't even just read smart authors and smart books who made this up. This is based on the word of God. And when we go, just to give you an example, First Peter, First Kepha, chapter 1, verse 18 reads, Knowing you were not redeemed with perishable things, you weren't redeemed with silver or gold, from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers, the best that you can give, the best that you can merit, whether it be in your actions or in your property or in your genes, your genealogy, I mean, not the genes you wear, but the G-E-N-E-S, the best you can offer, it is futile, it is perishable. That's all you've inherited from your forefathers. But instead of being purchased, redeemed with those things, verse 19, that with precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, and if you don't know who that is, if you don't know Isaiah 53, if you don't know other places that show Yochanan John 1, 29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was said of Yeshua Jesus, Isaiah 53, the shadow of the, the sheep that is sacrificed. If you don't know and you come all the way to keep it to 1 Peter without knowing, he doesn't let you wonder. He doesn't let you come to your own conclusion. The very next words that I read after it says, The lamb, the blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, comma, the blood of Messiah, the blood of Christ. He just says it flat out. It's there. This is what we're basing it on. So, is having... The centurious, the guy with the... Uh, centaurus? Half yeah. man and half horse centurious. Now, is that supposed to represent Rome? Or no. the Jews, and then the no. uh, victim is Jesus that no. died on the cross. No, the victim we'll talk about in a moment. The the half man, half horse is just to show the dual nature of the Lord Jesus, fully God, fully man. Okay, in mythology you have your heroes being part of you know two different you know animal and human or something like that. But for us, this is a picture of. Um, and, and we saw that when we looked at Centaurus in detail, a picture of his dual nature, that he was fully God, fully man. He had to be fully man to buy back our salvation, to redeem us, and he had to be fully God to be perfect, to be able to do it. So Centaurus has nothing to do with the nation of Israel, has everything to do with Messiah, Yeshua Jesus, saving the entire world, Arab, Jew, Persian, Spanish, Korean, <laughs> the human race, okay? So totally and completely. Now, we're going to look at who his victim is, and we're going to see something else more about him as we get into that today. <laughs> I have little ones at my feet, in case if you're wondering. Um, we looked at, okay, right after the scales, Keep it right there, Roger. Almost going off the chart, and I don't have any other picture for it, is that very little one under, we'll call it a horseman, okay? Mm -hmm. Under him. You see the cross? That's where we left off last time. That's the cross. Yep, there you go. You almost took it away, Roger. It's called Crux, C-R-U-X. There were five stars in it. Five is the number of grace in Scripture. I find that very interesting. Forms a cross. Is disappearing off of the southern hemisphere of our sky. It's the lowest thing, the last thing you're going to see there. Okay? It's as if this dual natured person is straddling the cross. His life is in relation to that cross. We know Yeshua Jesus came to die. That was his whole reason for coming. We're born to live. He came to die that we might live. Yes, Dora. Uh, is this half man, half horse? Is, is, he belongs to. Virgo? Mm -hmm. Okay. He belongs to Virgo. He was one of the three we looked at under Virgo. Okay. So there's like three on each one right. or four on each one? Three on each one. Three on one each major, one. three underneath. Okay. So Virgo had, and I went through them, I can go back and look at my notes real quick. Virgo had Coma, Centaurus, and Boots. Uh, boots, booties, yes, thank you. Those are three under it. Okay, then we went to Libra. Libra is the main one again. That's the scales, okay? And then we have under Libra, our first decon under Libra. Was it the cross? Was that the first one? Let me look at page five. 
Uh, oh geez, Libra. The scales is the big one, and then the, the cross is the first little one, and that's all we've looked at. We're going to look at two more, okay? So the cross is the first one under Libra. That doesn't mean, and you're going to see these are close to the major, but it doesn't mean they're right there. You know, we got a crowded sky <laughs> to see our story. So uh, it just, it's just how they broke it down. That under Libra comes the crux, the cross, and now we're going to see under Libra, very close to Libra this time, is Lupus, the victim. Okay, and that's, excuse me, what you're looking at. I may have more pictures of him, Roger. I don't know. the other one? Picture if you want, if you want, anytime you want to to show them different, that's fine. Um, remember again, we're just trying to give you some different ideas to look at. Um, we're looking at stars. We're looking at stars that form an outline. I'll put it that way. Now, lupus, we're going to call him a wolf. Okay, he's the victim that is slain. Now, these two, crux and lupus. Okay, the the cross and than the, the wolf, okay? We see in that, again, the, in, in the, in Centaurus, in that God-man, we see in that one that, that it's God, fully God and fully man. We see his two natures. The wolf is falling down dead, okay? But notice who's slaying the wolf. If it's not up there right now, but when we see it again or look at your map, the one who's slaying the wolf is that God man figure, okay? So it's half God and half man. Right. And we're going to see that lupus is well, before I tell you, let me let me give you a little more, then I'll tell you, okay? Um, <coughs> I don't want to confuse you. I'm trying to think which way is best. I think this is the best way. Okay. Lupus is the wolf. Another name for lupus that'll help, okay, is victima. Victim with an A on the end, victima, okay? Lupus is see on the screen right there, okay? Centaurus is the one who is slaying lupus. Lupus is the wolf or victima, the victim slain, okay? In, modern, in the modern name, lupus means a wolf. That's why we, we're going to call it the wolf, okay? But you can use another animal. It doesn't matter. What's important is that you see the animal is slain. He's in the act of falling down dead. And the ancient Hebrew name for him is Asida, which is to be slain. So this one, this victim was to be slain. Now, we're going to get into what's very interesting about that. The Arabic name, by the way, means the same thing as the Hebrew name. It means to be slain. Now, he's being slain by Centaurus. So he's being slain. <laughs> okay, no other way to do it than just to say it. He's being slain by himself. He's killing himself. What we are seeing is the God man we know is Yeshua Jesus. We know that he came to give the death blow to death, to sin and death. He came to pay the price for us. So he also is pictured as the Tima, as lupus, as the, the wolf that is dying. But notice, he's doing it to himself. Okay? Are you thinking of any scriptures? No, Let me take you. showing the horse killing him, not himself. Now, see the spear? The spear, the spear coming from the horse. The spear is coming from the hand of the man part. Right. Mm -hmm. So the man's doing it. Oh, you don't the see the part, head of the horse. The, God part. Oh, okay. the Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, and you can say that. You're safe saying that. Go with me to Yochanan, to John chapter 10. Okay, I think when I read this, it's going to begin to, you're going to go, oh, I get it. Okay, if not, I'll, I'll keep explaining until you do. <clears throat> okay, John 10, we're going to start with verse 15. Uh, actually, 14. 14 says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Now, 15. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. They will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it back. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it back. This commandment I received from my Father. Who's speaking? Jesus. Jesus. Yeshua Jesus. He is saying, I came 
so that I can lay my life down for the others. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to bring it to the raise from the dead, to, to how to say, to, um, to take it back. So he can give his life and he can, in essence, redeem his life. What we are seeing is the Lord slew himself. No one did it to him. He did it himself. He so freely gave his life. Is that the he's the wolf. He's the victim also. Oh, that's Jesus. He's the victim and he is Centaurus, God man. Fully God, fully man, taking his own life. And we'll see he comes back up. It's confusing. Okay. okay, okay. How can I make it a little more clear? He's the victim, but he's also the victor because he doesn't stay dead. He raises from the dead. No one else can do that. No one else could. I could lay my life down for someone. I could see calamity coming to you, jump in the way of the bullet, be the hero, take the bullet, give my life, you live, but I'm dead. <laughs> He didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. We're going I've to see. I've never heard of, of uh, Jesus being a wolf. That's what Mary is. You don't have to go by the name wolf. You don't have to. Remember, the shape is just to get the idea across mm -hmm. to us. The idea is that there was a victim slain. Okay. The victim, we tend to think of the victim as the loser. The victim turns into the victor because he freely gave and he could give it. He could take he it back up again. a little bit like a wolf, too. That's why they called it that. Oh. But remember, the ancient name is simply a cedar. And if you took away the shape of the animal, you would see the stars, like the tail, the back, the head, the paws. You see the stars. They just connected the dots. Mm -hmm. And they connected the dots in the shape of what they're calling a wolf. a wolf. But it doesn't mean he's a wolf because we know Scripture tells us that, that the bad shepherds are wolves in sheep's clothing. No, that's not what we're talking that's about. That, that strictly doesn't belong there. So if that's where it took you to take that out, okay? What I'm showing you is that he willingly gave his life. And that's what was seen in the stars. Say, no one was going to take his life from him. If I asked you, and I know you're all smart, you're my A-plus students, but if I asked in a class out in the world, who killed Jesus? There would be all kinds of answers. The Romans, our sins, the Jews at that time. You know, there'd be all kinds of answers. They'd all be wrong. If the, if the test was one right or one wrong answer, I'd give them an F on that. The last one, what should be said, is that he killed himself. He gave up his life himself. He freely laid it down. Do you think for a moment, he was fully God. He did miracles. Do you think for a moment that those men could have nailed him to a cross and kept him there if it hadn't been by no. his choice? No. There's no way. They even railed him. You said you were God. If you are, get off that cross and save yourself. And he chose to not do what they were saying. He chose not to make them crispy critters either, which I think shows he was God because <laughs> any of us would have wanted to, you know, shoot back. And he chose to give his life. But he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. Okay, so he's slain by himself, but he's also the victor. He, 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 he's not just victim, he's victor. Nobody else can do that. That's the impossible. That's our that God. Sense. And that makes sense and now. Good. Is, okay. That's fourteen to what? Uh, that was 10 John four, ten. To fourteen. John ten fifteen to eighteen. Fifteen to eighteen. John ten fifteen to eighteen, and now go to Hebrews nine. So John ten fifteen to eighteen, and then go to Hebrews nine. We're in Hebrews nine. We're going to look at eleven through fourteen, and then we're going to look at verse twenty six. Hebrews 9.11 says, But when Messiah, when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things having come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands. That is not of this creation. Okay, The Lord, as high priest, the greater high priest, went through the tabernacle that wasn't the one here on earth. So where was that tabernacle? In heaven. In heaven. Remember, the one well, on earth was patterned after the one Moshe saw in heaven, Moses saw in heaven. Okay, not made by hands, not in this creation, and he didn't go through that tabernacle with the blood from bulls and goats, or in this case it says goats and calves, but he went through his own blood. 
He entered the holy place, the holy holies, actually, once for all time, having obtained eternal redemption. For the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify or make clean for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit, through the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How do we get cleansed from our sin? How do we have our consciences clear? Through the shed blood of Yeshua and Jesus. He did it himself. He did it all himself. He gave up his life. He shed his blood. He placed it on in the heavenly holy of holies, and he raised from the dead. He conquered the last enemy. The last enemy is death, sin and death. And sin, the, the wages of sin is death. Let's look at it in a slightly different. You don't like wolf? How about sheep? You'll like sheep, okay? <laughs> the ancients called this sura, S-U-R-A. I have a feeling that's in the Arabic. It sounds more Arabic to me, than, uh, maybe Aramaic. I'm not sure. Sometimes my sources told me and sometimes they didn't. But sura means a sheep or a lamb. And when we look at it that way, if we were to say that was a sheep or a lamb, then go with me to Revelation. And those of you who have Revelation, I hope it's popping in your mind right now. Revelation chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 6 and 12. Revelation 5, 6 says, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing. Okay, a lamb is a sheep. A lamb standing as if slaughtered having seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. Now look at verse 12. In verse 6, we have a lamb who looks as if he's been slain. In verse 12, we have um, those the elders and, and the four living creatures and others around the throne sing with a loud voice. We've got a whole chorus going on, a whole accolade of heaven mm -hmm. going on. Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered who to receive power, wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. The Lamb, as though he'd been slain, has now resurrected and is receiving all of that glory seen in Revelation 6. I'm sorry, Revelation 5, verse 6 and verse 12. There's your victim becoming the victor. The Lamb that was slain, the, the Lamb that looks as if he'd been slain, that has resurrected. Remember I quoted earlier John 1, 29? So the really is the lamb. <laughs> it, it really, really, yeah. I would like it better if they'd done it that way, but yeah. I can't change it. So. <laughs> and Roger's taking you through everything you're not supposed to see till this time. Oh, they, don't, they don't see that. Yeah. Oh, I thought everybody's getting it. I know all my people in here are sidetracked, and I don't blame them. He's going through my whole repertoire. <laughs> all right, fine. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so, so now basically we have... Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, prefiguring. Then we see that the Lamb is slain. Then we see that the Lamb is resurrected, and we see that Lamb sharing the throne with God because he is fully God himself. This is the, the sacrifice of, and I referred to it earlier to, Isaiah 53. I'm only going to read to you verse 7. Yeshia, Isaiah 53, and verse 7 we read, He was oppressed and afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that is silent before the shearers, so he did not open his mouth. And if you go through the time of crucifixion, you will see when he was put on trial and he opened not his mouth. The perfect lamb of God who took away the sin of the world by putting his shed blood on the mercy seat in the heavenly tabernacle and resurrected from the dead so that it's not just paying the price, but it's conquering the price. If he'd only stayed dead, he would not be able to give us resurrected life because he resurrected. He has resurrected life to give us also. All of this we see in this one who is the victim slash victor. Okay? I like it. I hope you do too. <laughs> okay. Lupus, that's all three of them, right? That's two. Lupus, two. lupus and... Lupus. Um, no, no, no. Boots was in Virgo. Um, Virgo. Lupus and what was the other one we've done? We've, we've done we one more the before scales, that. We did the cross and we did the, yeah. the, the victim. victim. Yeah. The victim. Yeah, okay. I should have my mane. Next, next time I will bring my mane in front of me so I can look at it in a glance. Okay. The crux is the first one, the cross mm -hmm. under Libra. 
Okay, so we've got the scales now. We looked at the cross. We looked at the victim, lupus. Now we're going to look at the third one under the sign of Libra. And the third one is called Corona Borealis. This is the northern crown. And Roger, yeah. So the, so the cross Don't is move not it. under Libra. Here, here. Don't move it. The yeah. cross is, crux is the first one of Libra. Um, right in the middle. There you go. There you, you go. You want the one you made? There you go. Yeah, you can go to that in a minute, but for people who are looking on the maps like yeah. mine, circle it again. See, see right there? There we go. He's making a bit. Corona Borealis, okay? That That's the Libra. crown. That belongs to Libra. That's oh, the third one under Libra. You know, I think it'll help, and I said it before and I forgot. I'll give you an outline where I'll put the name of the main constellation, and I'll put the three smaller <laughs> underneath. <laughs> that will help. I'll do that, hopefully, Lord willing, by next week. And I'll send that out via email to those of you who have gotten these by email, okay? And if you want that and you haven't and you're not on my list, get on my list at the end of class, okay? That's much better. Thank you. Because I'm yeah. trying to... Right, right. And that's why we go to the bigger up here, too. So, Roger, you can show the bigger. And the crown is another one. If I look at it in the sky the way that I saw it, it really looks to me more like the, a tiara, like, you know, just the front that you would see, star, 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 star. But they draw in the whole picture like the crown. And so we'll, we'll look at the mm -hmm. crown. Um, they're seeing more stars because there's 21 Bless stars you. in this. Okay? Bless you. Wow. Bless you. 21 stars on the crown? Uh-huh. Yeah, you can't see them all, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> there, whoops. Roger, well, oh, okay. You, okay, he's screen sharing, yeah. so he'll, it'll be here in a minute for you guys. This one, there you go. See how you see kind of the outline, the tiara line? <laughs> they drew in the rest of the crown to show you it was like a crown. They're showing you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven stars, but I'm telling you in the whole, if you could see, you know, a, a real picture of the real sky and see it in detail, you could count 21 stars. If you, any of you have internet capabilities, if you go start studying astronomy, you study the stars, they'll tell you the colors of these stars, they'll tell you all kinds of fascinating, the sizes, where they are, how they relate to, uh, if I give you everything that I'm seeing, well, I could study 24-7 and not be ready for the next lesson and we would never get done until we're in the heavens seeing it and having the knowledge we'll have when we're home. <laughs> I'm giving you just an outline. What's the crown for the believer? Well, that's one of them, isn't it? This is the crown for the believer. That's one of them too, isn't it? Let's put it together. Is the crown, do we see the crown as a reward of eternal life? We do, don't we? We know there are five crowns in scripture that we have a chance of receiving, depending on what we do in our lives. So, the crown is definitely that noise stays, I'll close the door. I'm trying to keep enough airflow that I don't put my class to sleep. <laughs> okay. Um, we know that there are five we can earn. We're not looking at any individual. And we're just going to say the crown is eternal life. When do we get our crowns? When we've been ushered into the presence of the Lord in eternal life. That's when we will get our crowns. The Hebrew name for this... At the Bema Seat. At the Bema seat. seat. Yes, that's the judgment seat for the believers before the Lord. Notice where you are when that takes place. Are you standing outside the quilt pearly gates? <laughs> no, you are in heaven at the Bema Seat. So how on earth could that be for salvation or not? That's not what's up. What's up for your reward or loss of reward is what you did after you got saved for the Lord. The rewards you earned or the rewards you could have earned but you didn't get, you, you may in some way see that, but that's all that's up there. It's not a matter of whether the Lord's going to kick you out of heaven. No, you wouldn't have gotten into heaven. He's, he's, he's not there saying, well, you get to stay and you get to go. No, no. So crown is a reward. We're rewarded for, we're given the reward of eternal life and the crowns that we'll receive there. The Hebrew name for this constellation is Atara, and Atara means crown. So the Hebrew just cut through all the red tape and said it as it is. Now, when you look at it, you see some of the stars shine brighter. The front one that's shining very bright, um, mm -hmm. looks like three kind of almost in a row, and it would be the one on my right. That one is called 
Al Thecca, A L, new word P H E C C A, and that means the shining. It's a shining star. That's how it got named. In Hebrew, is Noga. Okay. Now here's where it gets interesting. Noga is also the name of the planet Venus, which they say Noga means bright and morning star. Okay. Who's the bright and morning star? Very good. Where do we find that? It's on the wall over there. <laughs> <laughs> Go look at the reference real quick. <laughs> How about if I help you in out? If you didn't hear those of you who are in the Zoom room, I have a chart that has all the names of the Lord on it, you know, who Jesus is, and that's one of the ones on there. So Smarty Rogers says, oh, <laughs> it's right there. I want that it's Revelation tw uh, 22 and verse 16. Last chapter of the Bible. The crowning glory of Yeshua Jesus we are seeing in all his glory in this last chapter. He is speaking, I, Yeshua, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things for the churches. I am the root, the descendant of David, of David, the bright and morning star. So when we see this crown, now instead of really thinking about it being our crowns, I see it as the crown and glory of the victim who became the victor. He's wearing the crown. He deserves the crown. He deserves the glory. Um, everything's provided from him through him. He's the crown of life. He gives us life. Any way you want to look at it, the crown, I think, belongs to him. And now when you look at the three that are under Libra, we go from the crux, we go from the cross to the crown. So we really don't count cross because that would make it four. No, that's only Under three. Libra is the first one. Yeah. Under Libra is crux, lupus, and corona borealis. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll write it down for you. I'll write it down for you next week. Okay? I'll give it to you next week. Yes. Bor. Yeah. Yeah. B O R E A L I S. But again, I'll give this to anyone who wants it. I'll have that, you know, I'll, I'll list it. Okay, oh. so that you don't have to worry about getting it all. I'm realizing kind of late what I need to do for you, but better late than never. What's <laughs> okay. the name of the crown? The name of the crown? The other name. You had another name for it. The eternal crown? Yeah. This one. Oh, the northern crown. Yeah. I think that's just because it's in the sky else, like pointing toward the north. The earth or something like that. The what? You had it's another name for it. Like for the crown? Yeah. The crown bestowed, the crown of the reward of eternal the name life. Of the stars, the, the, the whole thing. Oh, the star Altheca. Altheca means the shining. It's also the name of the planet Venus. That and the Hebrew means Noga, N-O-G-A-H, and Noga means the bright and morning star. The title that belongs to the Messiah. Interesting. The pattern of stars look more like a tiara. Yes. That you just slide on. Yes. Yeah. yeah. A crown. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a crown. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it looks like in the sky. Yes, in the sky you would see the stars and you'd see kind of the line like the tiara line, but they've drawn in the crown to make you realize it's a crown. So that's why I say we can't get hung up on the pictures. The pictures aren't exact. I would, I would liken the pictures to us when we were five and we were told to draw a picture, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we kind of get the idea, you know, and we can be so accurate. The five-year-old in Sunday school that was told, draw a picture of your favorite Bible story, and the teacher's going behind watching the children, and this one little guy has a car, and he's got a driver in the car, and he's got two people in the back seat. And the teacher's thinking, this has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. I told you to draw a picture of your favorite Bible story. So she calls the, the child out on it and says, you know, you're supposed to be drawing a story from the Bible. And he indignantly said, I am. And she says, well, then what story is this? And he says, this is God driving Adam and Eve out of the garden. <laughs> now, if he can draw a car, we can draw the crown, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Boy. No, that's, that's <laughs> okay. okay, what I want you to see is the cross isn't the end. The cross results in the crown. Okay, that's what I want you to connect in, in uh, Libra. The scales, we were found wanting. The Lord paid the price. He went from the cross. 
He's the victim, but he's crowned in glory. It goes from the cross to the crown. What's that song? I can't sing it, but it, it, it gives all of that. That he came from heaven down to earth, from earth to the grave, from the grave to the sky. I lift, I lift his name on high. See, I get part of it. <laughs> I need my musicians, okay? I'm sorely lacking, but I love that because it covers the whole story. Libra's covering the whole story. Remember how I said every time we see the atoning, we see the victor also. We see the whole picture. Revelation 5, 9, since we're right here. Remember, we, we were in Revelation 5 looking at the lamb. <coughs> As if slaughtered, the Lamb alive. Verse 9 we have there. They sing a new song. This is the 24 elders. This is others that were around, I believe, also. But they sing the new song. Worthy you to take the scroll. Break its seals, for you were slaughtered. You purchased people for God from your blood, or with your blood, I'm sorry, from every tribe, language, people, and nation. He's worthy of our praise. He's wearing the crown. He's wearing it for the entire world. Look at Revelation 3.21, moving backward in our, in our scriptures. Revelation 3 and verse 21. 20 is the, the people like the verse because they like to say, oh, look, the Lord's standing at the door and knocking. And I don't mean to ruin the picture for you, and you can still use that. But sadly, when we studied it, we realized he had been pushed out of the church, and he's standing on the outside now knocking, wanting back in. But look at verse 21. The one who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne. He may have been pushed out where we have a land to see a church that doesn't even recognize who he is, but he doesn't lose his throne. He wears the crown, he sits on the throne. The one who sits on the throne gets to wear the crown. Verse 21 tells us, the one who overcomes, I'll grant to him to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. So on the high throne up in heaven, God and Yeshua Jesus sit. I love to call it a love seat built for two. You see that it's equal. You see both of them on that throne. You see the Lord crowned in his glory. And then when you see him, I'm going to bring him down to his earthly throne here, where he's sitting on the throne of David, fulfilling the promises to Israel. And there we rule and reign with him. So those of us who have also been crowned are sharing the victory with him here. Not not God's. We're not equal to God, but we're sharing in that we get to rule and reign with him. All of this we see. The complete picture. The end of this chapter is glory. It's glory, hallelujah. He is alive. He rose from the dead. He's he conquered death. He conquered sin. He is the victor. Now that first time coming in humiliation, we see him the second time coming in glory. You don't wear a crown if you're not coming in glory. You ever seen a little child that go to what, Burger King and they get crowned for the day to get to, you know, wear the, the crown? Or if you take a little child and you dress them up for a day and tell them they're queen for the day or king for the day, you, as soon as you put the crown on their head, watch them sit up straight, watch them start to stretch, you know, it just lifts. That's, he is worthy of our praise. He is sitting on the throne, but he lifts us up in that victory also. We see this all in his second coming, and it reminds me, because we started with the cross, that we end with the crown. I'm taking us to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews 2 verse 9, that we do see him, Yeshua Jesus, who was made a little, uh, who was, okay, slow down Michelle, who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Yeshua Jesus, because of his suffering death, Remember Lupus? He's the victim. He suffered death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. He paid the price. He won the victory. He's crowned forever. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Everybody clear? Everybody good? Give me my Zoom audience back, please, Roger, so I can see if they're all good. Everybody here? Everything clear? Anne's got a question. Anne, keep trying. There you go. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm just a little bit confused in that um, I thought that the crowns were a reward that we would be giving him. Well, uh, we, 
We uh, will throw our crowns at his feet, but he's wearing a crown the greater than our crowns. He's wearing awesome. the crown worthy of the king. It's a different crown then that he's wearing. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Him. He's not going to pick up, in my mind, our puny little crowns and put them on. He's worthy no, of every I'm... crown, period. But that's just something that we have that's ours, that I'm thankful God gives me something, so I have something to give him. That's all right. that is, but he will be wearing the crown that will claim him to be who he is. He is God. He is crowned. Remember the high priest wears the mitre? Um, glory to God, I think it says. And he'll be wearing, you know, when the price is king of kings, Lord of lords. Maybe that's what his crown will say. But his crown will be okay. far more bigger and glorious and greater. Um, what he'll do with our crowns, I don't know. But he'll take each one as a <coughs> loving gift. I got to tell my little Ryan, this is years back, so he has to forgive me. He was maybe six years old, and it was near the holidays, and uh, he left his Annie shell. <laughs> and he took his favorite little green bunny, and he put it in a lunch sack, and he stapled that lunch sack closed, and he brought his gift to me. And when I opened it up and saw that was his favorite little bunny, I wanted to cry because I felt so honored that he gave me his precious treasure. I didn't even want to take it from him. It's like, Ryan, that's your little, your little rabbit, you know. But oh no, he wanted Aunt Shell to have it. That to me is a picture of how I'm going to feel to my God. What do I have to offer him? A little green bunny. <laughs> but it's all I've got. It's precious to me. You're going to offer your heart. And yes. Well, he's got my heart even now, too. But that's what he'll give me as a reward. And I'll be able to say, here, let me give it back to you. Let me put it at your feet. And he's going to pick it up and treasure it and love it. I still have his green little bunny, and that little guy is in his late 20s now, but I've still got his green little bunny. And I remember the tie between Ryan and I all the way to this day. Just a picture, very human picture, but I think it gets the point across. Go ahead, Anne. Um, is, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, just real quick, that reminds me of the story of the littlest angel. Okay. Did you, I saw it the, when it was that high. <laughs> oh, well, in heaven, the littlest angel brings a little shoebox, and this, everybody's giving the master wonderful, glorious gifts, and in this little shoebox is a, what he gathered, uh, being this little guy, a feather, a favorite stone, oh, and at the go. end of the story, the master treasures this because of the sweetheart that yes. gave it to him. Right. So it's, right. Yeah. And he will. But, He'll treasure our little gifts that are so less than what he's worthy of, but he'll love them. Yes, and we can even now gift him of ourselves. You know, we know that the story told of all the animals in the, in the stable at his birth, and, you know, I don't remember what all they were giving. The cow would give his milk because the baby needed milk, you know, and the, the fox had snuck in, and, the, you know, the fox wasn't even usually allowed in the barn because he's their enemy, and he's cunning, and he's slippery, and he's sneaky, and... And, you know, the others kind of didn't like the looks of him, but he wanted to bring his gift, and he brought his gift of cunning. And the other animals were saying, cunning? You're giving that gift, you know, for shame, you know, banish him. What a, a horrible gift. And the little baby, the little Christ child, was able to talk because, you know, this is a story. And he says, no, he says, I want that gift. I treasure that gift. He gave me his all. If you take the cunning from the fox, the fox has nothing left. He can't defend himself. He can't feed himself. He gave me his all. So we can come filthy. We can come unworthy. And he sees that heart. He sees that love. Just give your all to the Lord. He loves it now. But be thrilled with me. If anyone's ever done something for you in this world, you are very quick to want to reward them. You want to give them something. You want to do something for them. You appreciate them it more. You appreciate them more. Look at a hero on the, on the news, you know, who, especially if that hero has saved a child's life, then you see the parents, they can't do enough for that hero. You know, they can't show their love enough. Well, that's how I would feel in heaven if I were empty-handed. What can I give you, Lord? You know, you, the, everything belongs to you. What can I give you? Oh, you gave me this. This does belong to me. Here, have my crown. 
my grandbaby played as the littlest angel in a Christmas play, Aww. and I bought her a halo that lit up, and everybody afterwards said, your grandbaby made that play. <laughs> Giving her all. <laughs> With that, beautiful. Okay. <laughs> All right, I think we are ready to go to the next sign. So Roger's calling it up. I see him in action already. We're going to the sign called Scorpio, S-C-O-R-P-I-O. -O. Um, not that one. Oh, we, we had other crowns. Oh, well, don't worry about them. We'll show them another time. Um, Scorpio. <laughs> I did name them for you, Roger. <laughs> I, what happened did, I don't know. But it, that's close. There you go. There's Scorpio. Okay. Um, but I need the map so I can show them where to find. Oh. Go go over from Libra. Remember, we're moving uh, right to left. Go over from Libra, and you should see the scorpion. On the bottom? Mm -hmm. Yes, still on the bottom. I see his tail right there at the very bottom, straight down at the bottom, at the base of the page. Yeah, he's pretty big. He is big. He is big. There you go. There Number you go. three. Number There's three. three okay. <clears throat> Virgo was one. Libra was two. Scorpio is three. And that's why those numbers are there. And those numbers will go through all the way to number 12. Okay? This is chapter 3 in our book, our first book. And this is the Redeemer's Conflict. Okay? Conflict, his battle. The Redeemer's Conflict. In Scorpio, even though he's big and he's covering a big area, there's 44 stars in him. It's supposed to be a picture of a gigantic scorpion. And before you show this detail, go back to the other one because we got to see what's around him, Roger. Yeah, so go back to that one. We'll lift it up. There we go. Okay, now, he is endeavoring to sting in the heel a mighty man. See right above him, see on his head, the foot connects on his head. There's a line that goes through it so you don't see it exactly. Um, don't go away, Roger. Take your pointer. Okay. Zoom can't see this one. Oh, Zoom can't see. Uh -huh. Okay, oh, this man. is the chart I gave you all. And, and if you don't have the chart, then try to just listen and let me know, and I'll get the chart to you ASAP. Yeah, one, now they can. Okay, I can give you one before you leave. It was Redeemer what? The Redeemer's Conflict, his Conflict. battles. Conflict. C-O-N-F-L-I-C-T. These are sometimes hard words to hear. Conflict. They see it now. Okay. Oh, good. They're seeing it now. Okay, Roger's got it up now. So, I'm pointing out that there's a man above the scorpion. I think you can all see him. He's got his foot on the scorpion, okay? The scorpion is trying to sting his heel. The mighty man is struggling with a serpent. See the squirrely line going yeah. through on both sides of the man? There's the head of the serpent's under the crown. Cor corona is where we just were. The serpent's right underneath. He circles around, he comes on the other side of the man, you see his tail, there you go, Roger got his tail, okay? All right, so, uh, Ophiuchus, but we're, we'll, we'll take him individually. Right now I just want you to see the overall picture. So the scorpion is trying to sting Ophiuchus in the heel. Ophiuchus is struggling with a serpent, okay? But, even though the scorpion's trying to sting the man, the man's got his foot strategically placed where he is going to crush the scorpion's heart. Mm. Okay? I thought at first it was the head, but I'm told it's the heart. Mm. It reminds me of Genesis 3.15, where it says that, that the seed mm. from Satan, Satan himself, would crush the heel of the seed of the woman, the seed of the woman being Yeshua Jesus. Remember we said at the cross, the, the, the death on the cross was the crushing of the heel. Where the Lord in human form touched this earth, Satan thought he had the victory over him totally. All he managed to do was take that human life, which the Lord took back up three days later. It didn't even get to start becoming, um, um, dispel, what do you call it? Decomposing. Decomposing, thank you. It didn't even start decomposing because decomposition sets in on day four. So it didn't even get to do that. But Satan thought he had a victory. Instead, what happened to, to Satan in that verse, it says that he would crush his head. Anything that crushes your head, you're dead. If your head gets crushed, it's you're all dead. over. You're dead. You don't, the other's just you're a over. bruise. Right. The other's like a bruise. This is a, a crushing. Instead of it showing it on his head, though, here it's showing it on his heart. And the same thing, if you crush the heart, they lose their life. 
So it's showing the victory. We're going to see that victory more. Okay? So that's Jesus crushing the serpent. Basically, yes. Now, when we look at the man, and we're going to look at Ophiuchus in detail, when he's going to be one of the three we study under this. He's going to be number two under there. So I'll come back to the detail about him, but just overall, when we see him struggling with, I'm not sure how to say it, A-K-R-A-B, B as in boy, a crab, a crab, a crab, I don't know, okay? It's the name of the scorpion, that's the name they give him, they call him a crab, and it means the conflict or the war, okay? So war is going on, we see that with Scorpio. Let me take you to Psalm 144 and verse 1. Psalm 144 and verse 1, and we read in that verse, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war. The word akrab is there. Who trains my hands for akrab, my fingers for battle. And it goes on and talks about how faithful he is. He's our fortress, our stronghold, our savior, our shield. I love every single one of those is a picture of our God and how mighty our God is. But here we see that there's a conflict going on. Look with me at Psalm 91. A lot of you know this psalm, mm -hmm. I believe. Psalm 91 is a beautiful picture of our refuge. It starts out, One who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will lodge in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Okay, now. Keep in mind, that's who we're talking about. Go down to verses 11 and 12 now. For he will give his angels uh, orders concerning you to protect you in all their ways. On their hands they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Okay? If the scorpion's there to sting your foot, you're not even going to be faced. You're going to be lifted up by the one who is your rock, your refuge, your fortress, your shield, your deliverer. I could go on and on. We see in Matthew, Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, we see that Yeshua himself suffered temptation. Sometimes people are, excuse me, are tempted to say, God can't understand. He doesn't know what this human struggle is like. And you say, ah, 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 wait a moment. He was human. He took on human form and he was tempted. Matthew 4 gives us the whole temptation by Satan right after his um, he came up out of the waters of baptism to place him into the role of high priest, not for his forgiveness of sin. He had no sin to be forgiven for. But we read in, um, I don't want to read it all to you. Um, let's see, I've, I've marked for verses 5 and 6. The devil took him along into the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you, or you might have charge concerning you. And on their hands they will lift you up so that you do not strike your foot against the stump. Okay, here he's in essence saying, you know, I can't sting you. You'll be lifted up. And he's saying it falsely, but it's true. Even when the scorpion tries to sting him, all he can do is bruise his heel. He cannot take his life from him. The angels of the Lord do lift him up, but we know it's God, very God himself, the power of the resurrected Lord, God, our, our eternal holy God, the most high God, the only one true and living God, who keeps there from being anything but a victory here. In Latin, the name means scorpion or creature with the burning sting. And I'm told a scorpion sting is something you will never forget, so I think that fits. The Arabic name is a lot like the Hebrew name. The Hebrew name being a crop or however I should say that. The Arabic just puts al in front of it, A-L. And it means wounding him that cometh. Again, remember how the stars were to be signs of the one who was coming? Well, here the Arabic name is telling us that this scorpion is coming, is, is to wound this one who is coming. Okay, um, I should have kept this at Psalm 91. I don't remember why, verse 13 right now, but we'll look at it. Oh, you will walk upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. We're going to see the mighty man gets power over that serpent. That, that nothing is impossible with God. He is greater than. Um, Luke 10, 18 and 19 also. 
We've got how Satan tried to bring the Lord down in um, the temptation of Matthew 4. In Luke 10, verses 18 and 19, he's sending his workers out, the 70 that he's sending out two by two. And he said to them, um, I want, well, verse 18 is referring to another time. I watch Satan, an angel, fall from heaven like lightning. Remember when he's cast out of heaven, cast down to earth, he can't do anything about it because he is less than God. But verse 19, when the Lord said in these sent me out, he says, Behold, I've given you authority to walk on snakes and scorpions, authority over all the power of the enemy, nothing will injure you. Now, obviously, we get injured in this life. We're not talking about that. But they cannot, all he can, Satan can take from you is the human shell. He cannot take your soul. He cannot keep you from heaven. He cannot keep you from victory. Even if you lose your life, you gain the crown of martyrdom, you gain another crown, victory in heaven. So uh, we see that this one who was wounded by the serpent or the scorpion is going to have the upper hand. He's going to be the one that wins the battle. Um, the principal star, when you show just Scorpio now, I think we can go to that, Roger. When um, you see it, you'll see again. We can't see, like in here, it looks like it's halfway down his back. I think it's that one. That star has been given the name Antares. It looks like Ant, A-R-E-S, A-N-T, A-R-E-S. And it means wounding or to cleave or the cutting or the tearing. And it's it, it pictures... Satan, Satan's attacks against the Messiah. We've got right away Genesis 3.15 again when he bruises his heel. But we see how Satan has tried to attack the Lord all the way through. His line before he was born. He tried to get rid of the Jewish race so that Messiah couldn't be born. Then he's born and he sets it up where Herod kills all the boy, uh, male children two years and under. Then we see right after he, this baptism, we see him go after him in temptation. Then we see him in the Garden of Gethsemane giving Yeshua Jesus a hard time before he goes to the cross. We see him work in Judas to betray him, etc., etc., etc. All the way through, Satan's been after him trying to, to gain victory over him. Now, one thing I th found very interesting, this Antares, this principal star, you're in Hercules. Go go back to Scorpio. Hercules Hercules comes later. Go back to Scorpio. Last one. There you go. There you go. And that one just before it is also Scorpio when we're looking at just the outline. But this one, that star called Antares, that means wounding or cleaving or cutting or tearing, that happens to be a bright red star. Isn't that interesting? Because uh, it don't look like it has. And the, uh, your lights on it, you can to uh, describe it right. in the sky. Right. It's it, hard really, to find. it really can. So the, yes. The brightest one is the brightest red. one is actually a red star. Oh. There are red stars, there are gold stars, there are green stars, there are blue stars. God's creation is colorful. We look up and well, they all look the same color to yeah. us, you know. But when you get up with the um, close enough, with yeah, the, the more than the telescopes, you know, all the yeah. Yeah, not micro, but telescope. Yeah, when you can see them, then you begin to see. And I've, tell, I've told you other times, and I'll tell you again, sizes that blow your mind, you know, and all of that. This one, though, is the red blood. And I see in that the tola'at also, that that worm, that, that crimson red is the color that comes out as it gives its life for its babies. I see that in it. I think very much red is fitting in this. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 55. Actually, we're going to read uh, 55 to 57. For those of you making notes, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Okay, whoops, 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 whoops. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Where's the start? There's... Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Remember how it talks about the scorpion sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember our last Libra? We're, we've gone from the crux to the cross. We've gone from victim to victor. We go from the scorpion stinging 
to the sting is gone. We just talked about before this class started that we attended, some of us attended a memorial service and I said, you know, the hole is for those who are left behind, but death doesn't have that sting if we didn't know where our loved one was and that we would see him again and be with him for all of eternity. When you have that faith in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? Even that is not the end and not the victory. It's just a temporary separation till we're home together forever. So I see very clearly here the battle that has been won. I see the victory over the sting of sin and in death, uh, sin and death, which is what Scorpio is, is trying to do. Scorpio basically represents the evil one, Satan, in all his efforts to destroy the seed of the woman. All the way back to that very first prophecy, again and again and again, we will see it. Um, we're going to start into the three constellations underneath, the three decons as they're called. Um, we won't get through all three, so let me tell you by name. The first one is the serpent, or serpents, S-E-R-P-E-M-S, -E -E the serpent in our English, Nachash in our Hebrew. The second one will be Ophiuchus, the man. Okay, so the serpent that's, that the man's battling is the first one. Oh, the oh, man, oh. Ophiuchus, is the second one. And the third one under this is Hercules, the mighty man. And Roger's shown him by several times, even though he wasn't supposed to yet. <laughs> the one that's upside down? Yes, the one that's upside down in the sky. Can you go back to it? Yeah. You can show it for a minute if you want. We're going to look at all three of those, but we won't get there. He is. The, the go back. There's Hercules. Here's how you see it more in the stars on natural. And then when they draw in, when they connect the dots for you, now show the one that shows Hercules more like we're used to seeing him, and we just lost it. Well, I meant the other one, but that's okay. We'll get it, we'll get it together next time, because we're not going to get to Hercules. I've got just a what few more minutes one to go. Two, I got Hercules. What was one? Serpents, or serpent, is Serpents. one. It's that, it's, remember Ophiuchus, that man? Um, there's Hercules upside down. Yeah. Roger's got oh, his arrow on. With the club in his hand? Yeah. Yes, with the club in his hand, that's Hercules. We'll talk about Hercules next oh, week. There's Hercules. no way we'll get him this week. Okay? Why is he upside down? I don't know. I've worked on that one, too. I, it's just the way they drew it for us. Okay, under Hercules, though, is the man that's right side up. That's Ophiuchus. O P H I U C H U S. Ophiuchus, yeah. Oh, you know, I'll have all this written down for you, but he, we're going to study Ophicus, we're going to study the serpent in his hands, and we're going to study Hercules, who's upside down with the club, okay? Those are our three that go under um, Scorpio, okay? Okay, my real audience is good. I can't see my Zoom audience. I'm going to trust they're good. Let's look at serpents. Let's see if we can do the first one, okay? And we'll probably run out of time there. If not, we'll get Ophicus. The serpent, serpents, again, the Nachash in Hebrew means serpent. He is seen struggling in the powerful grasp of the man named Ophicus. Um, in the Greek, Ophicus is called the serpent bearer because he's... he's Holding the serpent, holding or the serpent bearer, he's holding on to that serpent. Ophicus has control over the serpent. That's what I'm trying to show. Okay, now look at where the head of, and you've got it perfect, Roger. Look at where the head of the serpent is. The head is under just the below crown. the crown, right under yeah, the, crown. the crown. That's what the head is after. The serpent wants that crown. He wants to take that crown, he wants to seize it. From the one who we already saw who it belongs to, the one who went from the, the cross to the crown of glory, he wants to seize it from him. He wants to gain dominion. He wants to take power away from the, the Son of God, the, the Redeemer of the world. And he wants to wear the crown himself. When did that all start? Before he was before he got thrown out. Right, before he even got thrown out, go way back before Adam was created. Let me take you to Isaiah, Yeshaya, chapter 14. Isaiah, chapter 14. And if you think that the Bible books are in order, they're not. You can get yourself a chronological Bible which tries to put it in order. 
but the, they talk about different times. Isaiah 14 is telling us before Adam and Eve were on the face of this earth. Um, because that's not my purpose of the whole lesson, I could tell I could take a 15 minutes on this alone. I won't do it this time. I've done it other times. But speaking about Satan, this one who was beautiful, um, really you're just going to have to read. You're going to have to go back and read from the beginning. The beginning tells you that it's against, I think it, this is the one that says it's against Tyre, but you'll see that it goes far beyond. Anyway, verse 13 is our focus for attention. You said, you serpent, okay, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. Does that take on new meaning now? I'm going to go above God's plan. I'm going to sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. We know God's heaven is in the north. We know it's above the stars that we see. That this is, the, this is one heaven. There's several layers to heaven, and God's heaven is higher. So this one, this serpent who's trying to seize this crown, is saying, I'm going to raise my throne above the stars. I'm going to be in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, verse 15, you will be brought down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Where's Sheol? Yeah. Hell. Hell. That's what it is. But where is it? Under our feet. Under our feet. It's in the heart of the earth. He's yeah. going to go from trying to go up to the highest, to God's heaven. He's going to be cast all the way down. So will we still like down there? <laughs> <laughs> but remember, tomorrow morning we're up here, yeah. so where is it? <laughs> He is being sent in that verse, when he goes into Sheol, he goes into the suffering side, that Sheol is equal to what we call hell, that he will be cast into forever and ever. So this one, who is reaching for the crown, who wants to steal the crown because it does not belong to him, is going to find himself going down in defeat. Remember, I already showed you that the mighty man, Ophiuchus, has control. I'll show you how we see that in the stars in just a moment. Now. Lucifer was, was created where God was not created. Right. So that would never right. put him on the level right. with God. Right, no, no. Satan yeah. is not God's equal opposite. No. Remember our little test? Jehovah What's the Satan opposite? Brothers. Yes, and they're not. They're not. That's a lie out of hell. Yes, it is. But remember our opposites? If I said stop, you say go. go. If I say up, you go down. down. You say down. Mm -hmm. uh, if I say black, you say white. If I say God, you say Satan. 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 Uh-uh. No. Jesus. No, opposite of God. Oh, no. Satan, Lucifer. No, nope. no, nope. not even no. Satan. No, not no. None of that. You should be totally Lucifer. quiet. <laughs> if you want to pass the test, you say nothing. There is no opposite of God. Oh. God is oh. greater I than the word opposite. Oh. opposite. Opposite of it's stop nothing. is go. Opposite of up is down. Opposite of God is it's nothing. So you don't say nothing. You don't say Because he's not opposite. He's not because opposite. like I said, he, he was, he was never created. created and Lucifer was created. Right. And all the angels were created. And Lucifer has some power. God has an ending power. There you go. God made the there plan. Satan's part of his plan. Not... The plan maker. Yes. So, no opposite, nothing opposite of God. Okay? So, this serpent did fight for the dominion of earth. Okay? We've hinted at this. Again, I'm going to do this and we will end on this. Um, I just have hardly anything more to say about this one, just a couple of the stars' names. So, let me just give it to you in a nutshell. Okay? Because I'm watching our time. Before God put Adam and Eve on this earth, it is believed that this earth was called Eden because God took Adam and Eve and put them in Eden, the Garden of God. We get that in Genesis, okay? Mm -hmm. When we get done with the Gospel of Stars, we go back to Genesis, we'll get this in more detail then also. Okay, when Satan, Satan, lifted himself up with that pride, wanted to be equal with God, and he... He is cast out of heaven. We know that he's not permanently cast out yet. That time is coming. But it's spoken of as if it's already happened. We know that, that he came down to earth. 
he goes after the woman who brought forth the male child. That's after Israel who brought forth the Messiah. We know that he comes here to, to try to go after what will be the Lord's domain, okay? But what about why, if we go back to the garden, why did he come into the garden in the way that he did? Why did he go after Adam and Eve? God created the heavens and the earth. We talked about it when Pam asked her question earlier. The, without going into what the gap theory is, let me just give you the Hebrew, okay? In Genesis 1-1, one, one, we're told that God created the, the heavens and the earth. I'm not going to go into those three words. That's a whole other class. You all know that. But in verse 2, the Hebrew says that the earth became without form and void. It doesn't say it was. It says it became. Isaiah 45 and verse 18 uses the same Hebrew words that are in Genesis 1-2 in Isaiah 45, 18, it says the earth was not created without form and void. Tohu pavohu for the Hebrew words, okay? So something has to have happened between Genesis 1, 1, when the earth was not created without form and void, and Genesis 2, when we find, verse 2, when we find the earth is without form and void, okay? It became. The Hebrew gives us the key. If it became, that means there's a process of time there. There's something so that, that changed. That's gap we talked about at the beginning. Right, right. Okay, now, here is the belief that this kingdom was Satan's. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel, I want to say 28, talk about this, where it talks about Satan walking up and down mm -hmm. and all the jewels that were on the face of the earth, how beautiful everything was, and everything was wonderful until pride was found in him. Then God judged Satan. He judged Satan's kingdom. The earth, Eden, was Satan's kingdom. That's why he was walking up and down to and fro on the face of what we now call earth. Okay, so when God took back what he had given to Satan, this kingdom, because remember, he was a, a lead angel. He was a head angel. He wasn't just any angel. He had a great position. He was the most beautiful that God had created. So when he lost his kingdom in judgment, that's when God brought on the face of this earth the form and the, the or the formlessness, the void. Some call it the chaos. I don't like that word because God doesn't create chaos. But he, I believe, flooded the earth the same way that we have the flood in the days of Noah, or similar anyway. And then God said, I'll never punish the world in that way again. But when the waters came over the face of the earth, it fits with Genesis 1-2 that the waters were found over the face of the earth and God separated the dry land from the seas. And we go through a recreation of the earth. He made it habitable for a human and then he created Adam and put him in the garden. Well, Satan knows that was his turf. He doesn't much like it. By the way, the jewels that were all on the face of the earth, where do we find those now? In heaven in the earth the jewels? the jewels we mine them out gold and precious stones we mine them they're out in the earth? Or they're they're in they're, well there's <laughs> jewels in heaven too oh, okay. <laughs> but i'm talking about in the earth instead of being on the on the outside oh yeah they've been pulling them out gold mines silver oh, mines oh, rubies oh, and oh, copper oh. and i don't know what all you mine but, but <laughs> let your mind go and you mine <laughs> you want to go See, for gold they used to be on the outside when we read in Isaiah 14. When that judgment of the floods of the waters that came over the face of the earth, Pastor Frederick asked me, he said, are you saying to me that God turned earth inside out? And I said, hmm. Maybe you could put it that way. Yeah. In essence, you know, what was beautiful on the outside was now put in. We have to mine those out now, okay? But Satan knows that that was his domain. And he wants it back. He's not going down without a battle. Any of you had a rebellious child? You punish mm -hmm. them and they hit back harder because they're stubborn and stiff-necked and you've mm -hmm. got to squash them a little, well, the right way. <laughs> I'm not an advocate of, of uh, hitting children. I'm not talking about that, but you get my idea. So, Satan wants back his kingdom. He wants to thwart God's plan because he wants to be in God's place. He wants all the worship. So, God's made human to worship him. I'm going to get in there, and I'm going to get them to worship me and to follow me. And we've got the story of the serpent in the Garden of Eden, and the rest is, okay, as they question. say, history. Now, you said that he walked to and fro. What made him come as a serpent into that garden? 
because he came in deception. He came to deceive. He came. He can he can make himself today still. He can make himself look like an angel of light, yeah, but he is yes. not light. Yeah, why did he walk truth. in like an angel to her instead of like a snake? Whatever, ask Eve why that was more appealing to her. <laughs> well, he can't. See, talk there about. wasn't the enmity that we have now. <laughs> that came with the curse. But he came in a form. I don't think it was strange at all that it talked. I think the other animals talked also. I think the curse. Um, the animal kingdom is the loss of their voice. I think there was far more communication, not less. But he did come in a form that deceived Eve as to who he was. So he didn't come as an angel light where maybe she'd known and could say, oh, that's Satan. I've heard about you. I don't know. We're not told everything. We're given just the outline. Well, I think it's because the uh, Adam and Eve's kingdom was animals. So he probably came as one of one of those that they were to be over yeah i can see that but they had far more than just animals but that was part of their kingdom too mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay so before I'm adam and eve fell they actually them and the animals were vegetarians yes until the fall and then god killed the first animal to clothe them but you don't have them eating meat until after noah's flood what was that? You don't have them eating meat, though, until after Noah's flood. That's when until God they gave the commandment. The and then he kills the animal and feeds No, no, no. The animal was killed and sacrificed to cover them, not for food. Oh. We, well, have, we have where they're talking about clothing, eating meat. Yeah. Yes, it is for the clothing. He clothed their nakedness that mm -hmm. they knew now they had because their eyes were open to no good and evil. They didn't know it before, but they knew it now. See, we'd be living in a world where they didn't kill any animals or kill anything. And that's what it will go back to. And that's what it will go back to. And we would be with animals. And we would be in good health because we would be eating vegetables. It will, it will and all we would live go back longer. to that. And we wouldn't have diabetes. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> and I got to rope you in because I just saw my clock. It's 3.32. Yeah, I'm saying the same thing. Okay, so... The point being of all of this, Satan's trying to gain dominion of the earth. He's still trying it today. If he is going to go down defeat, and he knows he is, he's going to take as many as he can with him. That's the battle that's on. He wanted to defeat the Messiah. He tried to. He thought the cross was his victory. He found out it was not. It was his defeat. He knows that he will be cast into the lake of fire one day. Until then, he's going to take as many people with him as he can, and the battle is on. But this one that we see, Ophiuchus, we're going to see next week. We're going to see he has power over that serpent. I'll show you how that's seen in the stars. I won't give it to you now because we're trying to hurry to get death, okay? But what Adam and Eve lost, the, the dominion they lost in the garden, Yeshua Jesus bought it back for us. He's paid the redeeming price, and we will have what was lost. We will see all of that coming. I'll even bring, because I'll have to review the serpent anyway, so I'll bring back the couple of stars and their names, what we have of them. Then we'll look at Ophiuchus, and then we will look at um, Hercules, and we'll see how all that is telling the story. What did I tell you? Um, the Redeemer's conflict is Scorpio. Um, but I told you, I thought I told you something else, and I'm not finding it now fast. I'm trying to hurry. The whole story that we get, it, maybe, maybe that's it. That in this chapter, we're going to have that conflict, but we'll see the victory. Because anytime we see the conflict, we see the victory. Anytime we see the defeat, we see the victory bought back. Okay, so that's what we're seeing. So, we'll stop it here today, because we are at that time when I'm trying to reel back in and stop us. Um, we'll continue on under... Um, Scorpio looking at the serpent and Ophicus and Hercules and then we'll move on to our next main constellation which will be number four on our chart. Let's go some prayer. <laughs> Lord God we see your amazing hand, your creativity and your plan that is beyond anything man could come up with and we thank you and we praise you for showing victory, for encouraging us each step of the way for procuring for us our salvation, for being crowned with victory forever and ever, for being our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer, our King. Lord, you're everything. We praise you and we thank you and we rejoice and we just ask now that as we study your word that we will see the fullness and the depth of the meaning and we rejoice that you could even put it in the sky 
before there was a written word so that people could see and know. And as we look back, Lord, we believe in faith also. And we thank you and we praise you because just as you came the first time, we know you're coming again. You will rule and reign. You will have victory. And Satan, Satan will go down in defeat. Hallelujah. We praise you and we thank you forever and ever. Thank you for taking care of us each day, for not only being in the magnanimous plan, but in the minutest detail in our lives. For this alone, we see you are God. Hallelujah. Praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.